Hi everyone, I'm Matt. And I'm Brandy. Today on this episode of The Chronic Couple, we're joined by our Instagram friend, Rising Zebra, or also known as Sarah. Hi Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you guys doing? Doing good. Yeah. Would you mind telling everyone uh, a little bit about yourself and what you're all about? Definitely. Well, first, Brandy and Matt, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here with you guys. My name is Sarah Schweifel at rising underscore zebra on Instagram, and I myself have ehlers danlos Syndrome, and my lack of treatment, if what you say, would actually brought me to Las Vegas, Nevada from Wisconsin. And I moved here August 2018. I'm a medical refugee, and I moved here for dry climate and cannabis. And now I really use kind of my what has happened to me to let other people know and to advocate for cannabis and legalization of it. Amazing. That is awesome. Uh, we are still in a state where it is illegal, which is insane because we live in Asheville, North Carolina, where it's like you smell weed when you drive into the town. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It doesn't even make sense. But we do have CBD dispensaries everywhere. That is hard to find, apparently. So they're just waiting to be, you know, to switch it over to, to cannabis. It's just like the second that it's ready. So how was that for you when you moved somewhere where you were used to having to buy it basically like off of like a drug dealer and then you know you move somewhere where it's legal like I just I I would have such a hard time like getting used to that not having to like look over my shoulder oh yeah the adjustment alone is just absolutely mind-blowing to me that you go from a state where it's illegal and you know I go to my friend's house where I went you know and it's you're always in usually a sketchy neighborhood and you go in and you get your stuff and it was always just this fear of what happens if I get caught, you know, mm-hmm. and there was always that no shame because I use it for my medicine. I needed to be able to get some type of relief. I was desperate. Mm-hmm. And then coming down here, I mean, it's like a grocery store. You go into the store, you pay taxes, you get a bag with it, you get a receipt. And it's mind blowing to me that it's legal in states like this. And yet people are allowed to suffer elsewhere. I talked to one person and they're renewing their med card and they're like, Oh yeah, I've had it 10 years in California. And my mouth just dropped. Cause it's like, how was I or anyone in that matter that are still suffering in states where it's illegal allowed to suffer when there is an option out there that could help? Yeah. And it's up to Absolutely. them to use it or not, but that option should be available. And it's just, it's so sad and so sad. And there's a lot of changes that need to be made within recreational and medicinal markets for patients. But I think first, the main thing we need to do is make sure everyone has access because it's so sad and just so sickening that people can suffer when you have places that are literally like a grocery store. Like there's one place here that has LED floors, koi ponds on their floors. They sell shirts, they sell hats. It's like a, like a shopping mall. Wow. And yet in Wisconsin, I would have got arrested for it. So how is that? that's fair for anybody in this no. world exactly it's, it is it's so really not fair. Not. especially it's like when you can go and buy weed inside of a place that looks like walmart i mean there needs to be a lot of folks let out of prison for all of the the crimes as far as cannabis i mean it's just insane i mean it helps so many people and um and i, I myself have have gotten pulled over with weed in the car before and just scrambled freaked out i mean saw like my career my life flash before my eyes over something that helps me we both have ehlers danlos as well, and, and I have mast cell activation along with it, and the cannabinoid receptors help to calm down my mast cells. I know, especially if I use it as an edible, it helps tremendously. And so for you, what is the biggest benefit that you get? So for me, really the best benefit is just life. It's giving me my life back. There was a time for two years straight, I laid in my bed. I could barely walk. I would need my husband to help me walk the 10 steps to my bathroom. I had a walker. I could barely move with my cane. It was hell. I mean, I didn't want tomorrow to happen because I was so afraid of future with so much more pain. I couldn't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And then here, it's like, I still have an ain't in pain daily. A lot of people don't realize that sometimes you need mass amounts of cannabis. I'm one of those patients, unfortunately, that needs mass amounts. So mm-hmm. what you can afford is what you can afford. And I have like an eight, but it's so much better than a 10 plus every day. Right. I can walk now. I can, you know, like sometimes we use a lot more cannabis and we go up to the mountain and, you know, I'm getting out of the car and I'm walking a few steps around and looking at stuff and it's just completely different. And also with like non-legal cannabis, it's such a different grade that you can get when it's legally grown. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to try legal grade cannabis yet, but it's absolutely mind blowing the difference it is. It's oh. such a drastic change in your body oh, of wish. what it can do. Oh. I so wish because me having mast cell, I actually was triggered into almost anaphylaxis once because we got it off of a sketchy person that we didn't know. It was obviously like moldy pesticides and 
one hit and I was like, remember that? I almost mm-hmm. went to the ER. Yeah. It was like, oh my God, it was awful. Yeah. Well, and then, and then the other thing is too, she doesn't actually do well with all the different types of terpenes out there. Some of those citrusy kind of smelling ones or the more perfumey ones really mess her okay. up. Yeah. Yeah. See, and if you were able to be in a legal state, I think it, or if it was legalized, it would change the game for so many people because you could, you know, really pick the right experience and the right medication that you need based off of those terpenes. And it's something that advocates for a lot just because ironically in, in many legal states, they actually don't even label terpenes. Um, I'm lucky that in Las Vegas, you have to, it's mandatory. So it's everywhere. But in many states, people have no idea what they're picking just based off the strain name and it's sad that this is happening. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it needs to be regulated so much. I mean, especially for people like us. Matt, actually, coming from his upbringing, was very conservative, both of us in Georgia. And so, you know, you're you're taught weed is bad. It's a drug. It's like cocaine and heroin and all this stuff. So because of that, before he met me, he had <laughs> never really been introduced to, I, to weed. I, well, no, no, <laughs> I, I had, but it, it, it was the equivalent of like pretending <laughs> seedy weed. Like there was, you had to pick out all the seeds while you're, when you're, and it was yeah, just like, what yeah. did you say? Like once at a party or something yeah, and it, he like pretended to inhale <laughs> and it didn't really do anything. Like first time she was like, Oh, you want to, you know, smoke, you want to smoke together? She goes, and, and I, I asked her, well, will I be able to work tomorrow? Like <laughs> I need to be able to work. And she was like, it's not like, it's not like alcohol. Like you, you'll be fine. And I'm like, really? Like, Oh, okay. I had no, no clue. <laughs> <laughs> he had no clue. Yeah. And then he was hooked. He's like you, he is like, um, it helps him so much in mass amounts. Like mm-hmm. I, if I try to keep up with him, I will go into the paranoia zone, but he just, it helps him so much. Yeah. And when she, can take massive amounts is when she's got like a level eight nine day pain level Mm -hmm. even when she's like keeping up with me and she's like again like more please and i'm like oh okay and even if i'm like barely able to get up off the couch i still i'm still like okay let me get it ready like it just it doesn't matter to me have you noticed that like on on really high high pain days like you know that nine ten day it's like you can you almost can't get high like you just got to do a lot yeah so for me it's really odd where i actually i don't get high really much at all sometimes i'll get like i'll take too much rsl rick simpson oil where it's very very potent and then i'll get like a tiny bit of a buzz but other than that my body just really absorbs it like water where i don't really experience the buzz or the high or the munchies involved or anything like that. And that's something that really happened more so when I moved to the medicinal market here and having the access to the legal cannabis where it's just my body absorbs the right things that it needs, I think, in the right amounts now. And it's just, it's what it needs. So it takes it, you know, and I don't have to, I don't experience that anymore. Oh, I would love that because honestly, that's so awesome. I don't like the feeling of being high. Like, I, I don't, I just like the benefits of, you know, less pain and my mast cells calming down and, but to actually be like high, I, mean, I, I don't actually like that. So that would be amazing. Oh my goodness. We need to go back. And adding Vegas. CBD into your THC really helps if you want to take that down. So like, um, if you want to mix say for instance, CBD flour in with your cannabis flour, it we might actually that. reduce that high feeling for you. Yes. Yep. We do that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it, we just started doing that when we moved here a couple years ago and it was like, Oh my gosh, my paranoia is gone. I, I will never smoke it without CBD again. It's like, what have we been, have we been doing for years? We went to Vegas once when we first started dating mm-hmm. for his birthday. And we had never been, either one of us had never been. And yeah, at that point, I don't know if it was legal there yet. No, it wasn't legal there yeah. yet. It, it legalized in January of 2018. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely wasn't. wasn't yeah. Yep. And I think at that point, too, I was hiding how much of a stoner I was. Oh, she was. She, she was. She <laughs> because, was. Because, you know, I knew he didn't know about it. I mean, his view of it was still a little bit through the lens of like, you know, what he had been had been told growing up. And that luckily changed very quick. And then it was like the the student became the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, he is, he's, yeah, it's like a she, special interest for him. He knows way more than me now. <laughs> yeah, she's no longer allowed to make our edibles. I, I'm, I'm the only one that does it, so. Have you ever had the, um, tried the Magical Butter Maker? I have not, no, but I've heard of it and I've seen it and it is definitely on my wish list in life, oh. absolutely. Oh. Yeah, you we've guys got, have one? Yeah, we've got yeah. one, and we actually have a, a discount 
coupon link in our in our links on our Instagram profiles. Twenty five dollars off or something. Something like that. It, yeah. It's like a percentage or something, but yeah. you get money off. Uh, it, I think it saves you at least ten or twenty bucks. Yeah, and when we first got it, we were actually making butter and then putting it in these like treats, and then realizing like, man, we're eating a lot of sugar, and so <laughs> he figured out. A better way to take it. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the better way, or the official name of it, is called coconut oil. We're, I don't know if we're going to brand it, but <laughs> that's definitely what we call it at home is coconut oil. And it's the coconut oil uh, infused. And we use the magical butter maker, and it's coconut oil cannabis. And we do we mix in some hemp CBD in as well, and sunflower lectin, which helps everything absorb. And decarb takes 30 minutes, and cooking takes an hour. And you're good to go. Yeah, it's awesome. We put it in tea, and then you can use it on your joints topically, and it also helps a lot. That sounds great. I was going to ask you if you tried it topically, because I make muscle rubs with the coconut oil, and that sounds magical infused with THC. Oh. Oh, yeah. And you know what's crazy? We just started doing that. It's like we... Like yesterday. Like, yeah. we, we've been making this stuff for months now. And... Yeah, like, my shoulder actually dislocated the other day, and you know how that is, just when I was, like, getting up, and... So it, it hurt really bad the rest of the day. And yeah, and, and Matt was like, you know, we can use that topically. I'm like, do it. <laughs> and um, it just felt so much better. Like, once again, what have we been doing? <laughs> when I start baking, I definitely need to ask for your guys' recipe because I have not baked yet. I buy my edibles, sadly. I'm so no. afraid of, like, decarving and ruining my cannabis with the cost of it right now. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, I wish we could just buy some. Yeah, no, <laughs> so I, cool. if we had the choice, we'd do what you do. Another thing that I read from your bio was that you were someone that was diagnosed with Ehlers Danlos earlier than most people. How old were you? So I was between four and five years old, actually, when I was wow. diagnosed. So very, very young. Some people have been considered me like lucky in a sense, and definitely in quotations, lucky. Yeah. Um, a little backstory on that. When I was a young kid, I didn't have necessarily a lot of pain, but I did have some dislocations. And it would just be I fell out of place, put myself back in, keep playing. Well, sometimes when I fell out of place with my thumb or elbows, I would have to go to the emergency room and my parents would take me in to kind of get relocated. And a lot of times it would just be me messing around and popping myself back in and we'd go home. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not normal for children to dislocate, right? Yeah. Especially an elbow here every other week. This is a problem now. So CPS got involved and investigated my parents, and that's when it took me to a children's hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it led to the diagnosis of ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Wow. And um, at that time, though, they told my mom, you know, it's no big deal. She's just bendy. She's quadruple jointed, not triple. I was quadruple because I was severe, they said. And I would just get arthritis in my hands when I was old, and, you know, here's some ankle braces. She'll be fine. And that was that. Oh. There was no treatment plan or explaining the dangers or risk it was just she's bendy and quadruple jointed and oh my gosh so would you say that there was really a benefit at all to being diagnosed early or not really there was in a sense that I was I didn't have to go through the fight for a diagnosis when my pain really took over at the age of around 22 was my first compression fracture in my spine and that's when my emostanos really came out for the turn of the worst for me but I think in that way, it benefited me because I had that diagnosis where I could tell people. And even though many doctors have no idea or still write you off as it's in your head or treat you so, so horribly, you know, there's things you can't even fathom sometimes these doctors say out loud to people who are fighting for help when they have pain. But for me, I had that diagnosis. So you couldn't tell me that I was crazy because I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I have proof. I have a piece of paper. You know, I have doctors that have seen me and 100% agree with it. So I didn't have to go through that, I think, in a sense of fighting for it. So there was a benefit because at least I knew. There was no benefit and you know it gave me no path of treatment or anything like that but it gave me that validation yeah that i knew what something was wrong i knew why i was dislocating and even doctors said you know well you couldn't walk around if your ribs were dislocated it's like they're not in the right place and they're moved out and you can feel it and see it so if something's wrong with me and at least i knew it was edf you know yeah. so that validation was something for me at least that i didn't have to go through what so many people have to which is so sad that they still do yeah, that makes so much sense because I remember when my EDS got to this like tipping point where I could no longer push through. It was like I was in my early 30s and I didn't know what was going on. Like I thought I was dying. I mean, it was just, you know, I had prepared in my mind 
you know, to go. And I had had mast cell symptoms before my entire life. I mean, my parents sent me to the best specialist, everything, starting when I was about 15. And they still didn't catch it, that it was EDS. They just kept saying I had autoimmune issues and like severe allergies, urticaria, and I was going into anaphylaxis monthly. I mean, it was insane. Nobody really caught it. So I just kept pushing through life, you know, thinking I just have bad allergies you know, not listening to a lot of my pain. And then when it got to the point where things were just, you know, that whole body ache that you get, I had no idea what was going on. I had never even heard of Ehlers-Danlos before. I thought I was dying. I mean, it was so scary. But yeah, it's like once we got the diagnosis from the geneticist, he basically was like, you know, I hate to tell you, but there's not really much else I can do for you other than send you to a, a good physical therapist and mast cell specialist. But as far as like an EDS specialist, there really aren't any. And it's just management. And it was like, we we sort of were shocked. We're like, whoa, we thought this was going to open doors, you know, to this, you know, being able to, to manage this condition. And and it really didn't because there's just not much they can do other than than management. And, and that's just so sad. Do you have mast cell also? I do not have mast cell. No. Okay. So I have tachycardia, so I have a high heartbeat, mm-hmm. but I've never been diagnosed with POTS. I think really it's just kind of finding a specialist to see exactly what's going on with the tachycardia. But, you know, I've seen numerous doctors and they're just like, well, you know, fast heart rate, just fast high resting heart rate. And it's like, okay. And then they refer you to a bunch more specialists. And I think for me, it's just how many specialists can you really see? And before you just get sick of hitting into the same brick wall where, you know, I've tried to see 20 plus doctors and they're all like, well, you know, there's nothing I can do for you as they Google EDS in front of me. And I still just spent that copay, lost money. And they still are just like, well, Google says it's over for you. So here's <laughs> what it is. Sorry, I wish I could scribe you pain meds, but I can't because there's an opiate crisis. Yeah, and then yes. they send you on your way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's really the most maddening thing when you you're asking for help and you get that kind of a response from people that are supposed to be helping you is is crazy. Would you say your because you you touched on it a little bit, but would you say that injury your spinal injury was your worst EDS injury or what what was your worst you would say? So that was like the beginning of it all was my compression fracture and my, my first compression fracture, shall we say, in my thoracic spine. And then after that, it started with the pain and dislocations and it's like your whole body, like you said, Brandy, it's just like it starts to shut down, like mm-hmm. something's wrong and you don't know what's happening and all of a sudden you're dislocating more. And for me, my spine was hit the worst. Um, now I'm at 10 plus injuries in my spine. I have numerous compression fractures, numerous herniated discs. I have osteophytes, bone spurs, degenerative disc disease cervical stenosis, kinfolias, um, it just goes on and on, you know. And I think for me, that's really the worst in my EDS is my spine and yeah. just everything that's happening with that. That's what really affects me being able to walk and being able to function and the constant pain every single day. Yeah. It also causes like my ribs to dislocate and my shoulders kind of connect all the spine, of course. So since my spine is affected, that has been also hit the worst. That's the worst one, too. It's mm. like it holds you up. I mean, I have seen on your account that you are kicking ass at some PT. Um, Thank you. <laughs> physical therapy. Oh, my gosh. It, I mean, I was sort of I had caught myself a little bit, you know, now that I can't really go to PT during this quarantine, kind of letting that slide. And I can tell, you know, that that, it, you know, you've got to keep those muscles strong. And I was rolling through Instagram and saw you doing your PT exercises and that ex- inspired me to, to do some. How has that been like keeping up with your your management during this crisis? So for me, I'm in now I'm in, in PT now for nine months. And I always say nine months in a lifetime ago, you know, this is forever now. Mm-hmm. And I have a wonderful physical therapist, which is great. My husband stays me at home. So that helps with the spasms and like combating after me doing physical therapy. I do it once a week at home and sometimes once every other week, you know, depending on how long it takes for my muscles to calm down. Mm-hmm. Physical therapy is is very difficult. I tried physical therapy in Wisconsin. I could not do it at all. And it had nothing to do with my mindset and everything to do with the amount of pain control that I had. Mm -hmm. I couldn't physically handle the amount of pain that it caused to work out. Now that I have cannabis, I'm able to push my body more, and it's kind of allowing me to be able to do it along with the dry climate here. And it's still, it's a fight every single day of my life. Wow. You know, I, I lift, and instantly my shoulder spasms. It gets angry. It doesn't want to do this. It dislocates me. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of just like a constant daily fight that I have to do and a constant cycle that I'm in right now. Finally, I mean, I started lifting air. Now I'm rowing 
five pounds. Now, after nine months, we're adding in my chest, my chest and my lateral muscles to kind of help support my spine even more. And I truly believe 100% of my soul and my heart that working out is right for me. It's right to build my muscle and try to get stronger. It might not be right for everyone with EDS just because, like I said, I, I sat in bed in Wisconsin. I couldn't do it and nothing to do with pushing yourself. And that's what I really want people to know is I don't want people to see my journey. And I'm so thankful. Like when you said you got inspired to do it, I'm so thankful for that. That's why I share it. But I also want people to know that just because I'm doing it right now, it doesn't mean that it's you have to do it right now. It doesn't mean it's your right time to do this. You know? Yeah. And it course. is. It's hell, but it's my thing that I'm doing and I believe I'm on the right path. So I'm working on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is exactly like you said. It's like a lifetime thing that we just like have to work on a day at a time. And it is, it's tough. Yeah. Cause I remember the first time my first PT visit for the evaluation, you know, when they start pushing all your joints and all the other different directions to assess how hypermobile you are. Oh my gosh. I remember she was doing it in these small little micro pushes in each of my joints, all of them really. And at the time it didn't really hurt that bad. It was like, Oh, she's just moving my joints around. And then she kind of casually mentioned, you know, this is going to really feel feel bad tomorrow. She apologized to Yeah, <laughs> she's like, I'm sorry, but you're not going to like this the rest of the week. You know, you're going to pay for this, but I have to do it. And I thought, man, eh, it won't be that bad. Like, that didn't hurt. I couldn't walk for a week. It was just like, I was shocked when I woke up the next day. And it was like this realization of, wait a minute, my body is falling apart right before my eyes. And that's something that most people would have no problem with. And it immobilized me. I mean, so it made me question, yeah, is PT right for me right now? We sort of had to, my PT, the first, the first 10 weeks that we did it, we had to kind of cater it to my abilities that day. And I would say probably like 70% of the time we didn't even work out. We would just do, she called it putting out fires, <laughs> like laser therapy or dry needling or the release of tension somewhere or something. And yeah, it, it was like my physical therapy wasn't really working out. It was just like, but as I got stronger, I was able to do more. But yeah, you're right. Like it's not for everyone. Like everyone can't do it. And before I realized I had EDS, I was doing boot camps, boxing, spin class, like getting severe injuries like boxing that was six months of physical therapy after spin class i dislocated my hip that was several er visits and i had no idea like if i had had eds there's no freaking way i would have done that stuff i mean if i had known i had eds for me it was just like oh that diagnosis made me look back and and think of all of the things i did that i had no business doing really and people just would tell me you know, just push harder or you're just out of shape. I would try to run and I got exercise induced asthma. So every time I would run, I couldn't breathe and I would like start coughing and wheezing. And because I'm not a thin person, people go automatically to, it's because you're overweight. You just need to try harder. And and just like you said, it had nothing to do with how hard we're pushing ourselves. You can have like the strongest willpower in the world and EDS doesn't care. It's like you can't push yourself past your limits or you're going to pay so hard for it. I mean, is that something that you've had to learn over time? Like, because for me, it has been something I've had to learn that I still struggle with. Basically, like if I feel good, not overdoing it that day. Absolutely. I overdo it on good days. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, we recently went out and took a drive to nature and I used more cannabis than usual and I overdid it. And I enjoyed my life that day and I was so happy, you know? And it's like, I enjoy those moments. I value those moments. But at the same time, when that flare comes, I'm still angry. I'm still frustrated. I'm still like, why did I do this to myself once again? Torture myself, you know? Yeah. But it's like, sometimes it's like I can't continue to lay in bed for myself you know it's like I spent a lot of years stuck in bed so now that I have that opportunity to try to do a little bit more I think I'm I often push a little bit more out here especially like with holidays or when my stepdaughter is home or just new experiences with the family I often do that but then I'm still angry with myself and every time I'm like I'm not doing that again and the next weekend or the next week or whenever I can do it again I'm ready to do it again you know Same. even PT I often tell myself like I'm not doing this I'm torturing myself why am I doing this and then next week, as soon as my muscles are just a little bit, you know, a little bit less pain, I do the same thing all over again. It's like, all right, one day it's all worth it. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I'll even know, like, that I'll, I'll, I call it taking the hit. 
where I'm just like, I really shouldn't be doing this. But Not the really, good kind of hit. I really want to, and I'm just going to take the hit. You know? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. It's like it's the, worth it. Definitely. In the beginning, when my pain really kind of took a toll for the worst, I actually showed my husband. Um, at the time, it wasn't my husband. We were just dating. He was my fiance, but... I showed him the spoon theory. Um, are you guys familiar with the spoon theory? Oh, yeah. We, we're spoonies okay. for sure. Yeah, and I think it helps it really just kind of help people understand, you know, and now we have this thing when we want to plan something. He's like, hey, save your spoons. We're going to go out in a week, and then I know, like, don't push myself because I'm going to do this on Friday, and then I'll pay for it a week later. But mm-hmm. I think you just kind of find a way to manage and balance that roller coaster that now we live on, and it's a little wickety-wacky, but we got, you know. Yeah, exactly. Could you explain the the spoon theory for anyone who might not know? Yeah, so the spoon theory is basically, it was created for Lucas initially, and I can't think of her exact name right now because of brain fog, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I could. Um, but the spoon theory is basically a way to explain to people in your life with, you know, that have someone with chronic illness that, and show them how we live our lives, where, you know, you have 12 spoons in a day, for instance. So now, You want to wake up and brush your teeth, that's one spoon. Now you want to make breakfast, that's three spoons. Now you want to take a shower, that's two spoons. Well, now you only have six spoons left for the day or how many left, and now you you have to expend that amount of energy for the rest of the day. So it's basically a way to show in in the value of spoons of how people with chronic illness live our lives with very limited amount of energies and really picking and choosing what task is more important that day. You know, do I want to do dishes? Or do I want to sit up and eat dinner with my family? Because unfortunately, some days it's only one or the other. Mm-hmm. Most days, for many of us. <laughs> yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Oh, you explained that perfectly. It's like, it, when I heard about the spoon theory, it honestly helped me to release so much guilt because I had convinced myself that I was lazy. And that's something that I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not lazy. She's, she's far from that. <laughs> and, it, you know, because I would compare myself to other people. It's like, well, why can't I do the dishes and the laundry and go to the grocery store and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't even have children and these people are doing all this stuff. Like, I guess I'm just lazy. That's not how it works. Yeah. And so it, it helped me to feel so much better about, about myself. Oh yeah. I think it's so hard that it's really just that ableism within us and, and who we we were before and that constant grief in a sense, you know, I still have moments where I ask my husband, like, you know, I want to work, right? And he just looks at me in shock and is like, of course, like, what are you even talking about? You're a career woman. Like, I know this about you. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. I just have those moments, even with, you know, other people and within myself that it's just like, but I want to do this, you know, and you just yeah. battle within that grief. Oh my Absolutely. Gosh. I say that to him all the time. Like mm-hmm. when he first met me, I was a business owner. Like, I mean, I was a professional singer, background singer, like, and it was in two bands. I mean... I was pushing myself so much. I mean, I was miserable, honestly, in pain all the time. But now I, I'm disabled. I mean, I can't I can't work. If my EDS was managed, I still can't. And I tell him that all the time. I'm yeah. like, you know that I, I wish I could go back to work, right? Well, and, you know what's, what's funny when both y'all are talking about this is Brandy's absolutely right. Like, when I met her, she was running her own business, very ambitious, and I've seen the ch- we've been through our relationship and finding out all of these chronic illnesses and what really I've tried to explain to her just because your body is holding you back doesn't mean you can't do your passions and what you enjoy. And I've tried to be supportive and they just have to be different. They have to be yeah. different. Like within we found digital art for her and that took away having to deal with chemicals from paints or any of the solvents or any anything that could trigger her mast cell, now she's able to do with an iPad and makes all the difference for her creative outlet and her being able to do something that yeah. is fun. But there is, there is a grieving process, though, because True. Your passions have to change because you realize, I can't do that anymore. You know, I used to love to go on hikes with him and can't really do that anymore in the sense that I used to. We have to, you know, make sure the trail is is uh, not too crazy and we can't go for as long. Sometimes I can't go at all, not even near as much as we used to. And so, yeah, it's like you have to grieve almost that, that loss of who you thought you were. My doctor actually just said this to me. During this whole COVID thing, I've been kind of stressed out. My medical care is 
completely different or lack thereof really. i've been like losing hair and they think it's from stress. she was like, well, what's been happening in your life? and i'm like, well, let's see this past year i started having to use a wheelchair more and like braces. i had to quit the band i was in i'm filing for disability. i mean, she was just like, no wonder your hair is falling out. you just lost your entire identity and it's like yeah, i mean, and i had no choice really. so i guess i i just have to i'm trying to create a new identity and and help people and help spread awareness for eds because i just don't want anyone to feel the way that i felt, just not knowing and not understanding and then putting everything on yourself like it's my fault, my fault. you know, i just need to try harder. just people don't understand. have you had to deal with that at all like uh people almost like not believing your pain because with EDS, you know, it's, it's, it's invisible. I've had, for mine, it's been more from the medical side of doctors not believing my pain and, and medical staff and medical trauma, and I have PTSD from it, of just, and that side of them not believing. I'm very thankful and blessed that I have people in my life that do believe me. I have my mother and my husband, and they've never questioned it, and I'm so thankful for that because I hear of, you know, and I speak to other people where they have family members or their loved ones say, well, you're really in that much pain, and it just breaks my heart because it's like, how dare you question what someone else is telling you, especially when it comes to this. And I feel it. And if my family looked at me and said, what, are you sure you can't go to work, Sarah? I don't I don't know. That would break me. And I just I feel so bad when people do treat others like that. And that's a lot of why I talk about it as well, because I want people to know that, one, that it's real, and that, you know, the way that you feel, like with the grief and the loss and looking back on who you once were, that's something that so many of us, if not all of us, deal with and still deal with. And many of us, you know, like myself, I still grieve myself, you know, probably at least once a week, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. It gets very mm-hmm. difficult. Yeah. So I want people to know they're not alone, especially in situations where they don't have family that supports them. And it's just, I can't even fathom how that could be. Right. Yeah. It is tough. <laughs> it really is. And you, you actually touched on something earlier that I wanted to talk a little bit more in depth about dry climate, because both me and Brandy live in a a little bit more humid climate we and live in a rainforest. Yeah, it, it's 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 too <laughs> like much. A and, rainforest in the mountains. Yeah, and we can tell you when the when it's about to rain. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the dry climate and how it's helped and what it's done for you and all that good stuff? Yeah, definitely. So the dry climate for me really takes out the ache in my joints. It helps a lot with arthritis. I have lumbar arthritis, and it's crazy because when it rains here now. I feel it so much in my lumbar spine, and it's like, whoa, I used to feel that all the time in Wisconsin. That's what it felt like pretty much 24-7 there. And those are those little moments where it hits you how much the climate drastically helps. And, like, when it rains here, my ankles will dislocate more, my knees will dislocate more, my wrists will slip out more. You know, those little things that kind of wobble out, and it's like that doesn't happen as much when it doesn't rain, though. It still happens, but not constantly where you know, when it rains here, I'll walk up the steps and every step I take, my left knee just slips in and out, in and out. And then when it's not raining, I don't have to deal with that anymore. So it's something where it's the dry climate drastically helps. Like, I don't, I wish I understood more the science of why exactly it helps me, but it really takes out, like, I guess inflammation it might be helping within my joints where they're slipping out less and their arthritis, it helps a lot. Wow. From that's yeah. that's awesome. We uh, need to move to a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have actually talked about moving to Arizona before. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm dry. highly allergic to mold as well, so you know any sort of humidity is not good. And it's funny. Typically, pe- people talk about like even our, our geneticists talked about how women are more affected by EDS because of our hormone surges and and things like that. It impacts my life a lot more than Matt, um, but it also impacts his life a lot with like the pain in the joints. And for some reason, when it rains, he is worse than me. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I mean, he will, yeah. I yeah. My joints hurt and everything. Or I don't know, maybe my pain tolerance is just higher because, you know, us chicks, we can <laughs> we can handle some pain. <laughs> She's been handling a lot more pain throughout her life than me, for sure. So, <laughs> but yeah, that. when it rains, it's like he just breaks down. Yeah, I mean, I'm, so. I'm a little baby. And I'll, I think... I'll admit it. <laughs> it. Well, no, I mean, it hurts. Yeah, nice it does. Here, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it... <laughs> That's it, the nice part, too, here is... It, it doesn't rain often and it doesn't snow, right? So, I mean, it snowed once here, but it was like for two hours of fluffy, beautiful palm trees went away right away, you know? Nice. Um, so it wasn't really snow, nothing like I grew up with where you get inches and feet at a time, you know? So I think that alone also really helps you. You don't have to deal with, you know, the five months of winter where you're just living through basically hell because 
the climate is that bad for your joints and your body usually. That's how it was for me at least. It was the winters were the worst and the rainy months and Oh, yeah. It just was not okay at all for my body. Yeah. I think we need to, like, take a an extended trip to, like, Vegas and then just, like, see how we feel. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> so yeah. If we feel tremendously better. I mean, when you first moved there, were you just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, so we first came down in January of 2018 to get married. I really was struggling bad. Like, I could barely walk when I was getting off the plane. It was hell. And I just kept thinking, like, I can't survive these three days. There's no way right now. And we went to the dispensary to get me some medicine and... Then it was like that wave hit and that crash hit. And all of a sudden, I had less pain than I've had in years and years of my life. And doctors said it was impossible for me. And that's when we kind of really just bought me tons and tons of cannabis that week. There was a weekend. We stayed three days. So we bought a lot of cannabis. And it was dry. It was in January 23rd. But we got really lucky. And it was really, it was pretty warm. It was like 55, 60 degrees when we were down here. So I kind of got to experience that. And it was just amazing. I was just doing better than I had in years. And my husband said, we'll move here. And Then in May, we came down once more for three days just to check out the residential areas and really just to have me try cannabis again, I think, to make sure that it really worked and was worth moving 1,800 miles for. And (laughs) it helped me again. And so we moved here August of 2018. So I didn't spend, I guess, too much extended time here. But I think once you feel it, you just kind of know. Like for me, it was a miracle instantly. It was something I haven't felt ever in my life. And I knew I could do it. Well, in the past few years of all the pain that was happening at least, yeah. It was just something where it was like, wow, I have way less pain. And on the vacation, I actually had a two-in pain because we spent about $400 a day on my cannabis while we were traveling just to really see. And wow. I had a two-in pain and was just living my best life. It was it was amazing. It was very hard to leave because I did not believe we were going to be able to move here, I'll tell you that. But we we made it. Yeah. So so when you were doing that, that 400 worth a day i I gotta ask just because the the weed yeah (laughs) that that's that's amazing um were you doing like dabs or like huge like what what were you doing because i'm just curious as far as so at that time i started taking just a normal oil tincture and then i was using edibles and then just pre-rolls after pre-roll after pre-roll it was ironically it's illegal to smoke outside here you have to smoke inside of a residence but as a tourist, you don't have a residence, so you just kind of smoke pre-rolls, you know? Um, so, yeah, I was doing that. And now I use DAB um, flower as well as RSO, so I've switched it up and kind of learned a bit more after I moved, of course. But at that time, that's what I was using. Oh, we watched the documentary on Rick Simpson oil, and, oh, my gosh, we wish yeah. we could get our, hand, our hands on some of that stuff. I mean, do you do you find that helps you significantly? Oh yeah, definitely significantly. Um, that plays that's one of a, a huge huge game player in my cannabis routine and um, flowers as well, of course. And the dabs really help because they're very potent. But the RSO is my body needs a high amount of THC, and I can get you know RSO that's 600 to 800 milligrams of THC out here. So it's something where I can dose in high amounts, and I'm able to afford it. And I'm able to do it. And I wish I could take more RSO, but I'm also thankful for the amount that I have, of course. And it's it's amazing what it can do for your body. It really is. It helps a lot. What what is RSO? I, oh, I Rick actually, Simpson oil. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the acronym threw me. <laughs> yeah, the, the documentary we yeah. watched. Yeah, no, no. We were like freaking out, and then we found places you can order it. But of course, you know, not where we live. Yeah, we lived <laughs> so, in Canada. Sure. Like, oh my gosh. But I want to do that. I want to, I want to try that so much. I mean, it, yeah, we may be having to take a road trip to Vegas. Yep. <laughs> How has that been affected with the COVID crisis going on? So all our dispensaries actually are closed, but they're open for delivery at least. So that's positive. It's pretty hard to get some medicine. A lot of places actually only sell flowers. So for a good week and a half there, I was out of RSO and oh. I was out of my shatter. And it was a little bit of a tough time to say the least. Absolutely. And finally, I found a dispensary that's still, you know, doing their whole entire menu. Um, but you send them pictures of your ID, and then someone comes and kind of delivers it. I, I guess like a pizza, which is mind-blowing that I can say that coming from Wisconsin, right? Yeah. But they <laughs> just order it, and they deliver it to your door now. Oh, my God. Um, I'm so jealous. Oh, yeah. man. That's amazing. So they do have some options where, like, they don't necessarily tell you certain numbers. So some patients are running into issues there. I found a dispensary which is helping me out, at least, with finding numbers on Shatter and 
thankfully. I still have a little bit of flour left. I have to order next week now. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a shock not being able to go in and the medicine just like that was almost taken away, you know, and it, it was very nerve wracking and it still is, you know, because you don't really know if there still is more. And a lot of people are stocking up and there's a doctor, I don't remember the exact name, but he said that when you smoke marijuana, it could irritate your lungs with COVID. This is what he said. It just came out. And there's no proof. There was no scientific evidence that I've seen behind it yet. But it made a lot of people rush to the dispensaries to buy RSO. So when this first happened, I actually couldn't even stock up on RSO because they were out at the dispensaries. All the recreational people oh bought it. Wow. So it was a huge issue with the shortage of supply. And now they do have supply. I haven't run into an issue yet, um, thankfully. But yeah, it's definitely some issues with getting cannabis in many states that I'm finding and talking to people. They're just really having huge problems right now. Wow, that's insane. And like I myself, um, I buy recreational. The card is um, $200, $250 here for a medical card. So, you know, moving is very expensive and we don't have the finances to pay for it yet. So I just choose to buy recreational and it will work. Then there's always that fear of when does that become non-essential and they only go to medical and then what do I do? Right. Um, so it's just that constant of get as much as you can and just hope that it opens up again and they keep selling to recreational patients like myself. Wow. That is so scary. I mean, absolutely so scary. I mean, the way that this is affecting the disabled community, it's insane. I mean, it's funny, though. It's kind of strange because, in a way, it has affected us, I mean, in such a negative way because, you know, we're at higher risk. You know, we're we're kind of used to being afraid of getting sick all the time and, and isolating and having to be in the bed for long periods of time or in the house. So, I mean, I was kind of prepared for the isolation part of it, but the loss of medical care has been, it's been nerve wracking. It's caused like this anxiety. The other day I, I almost had an anaphylaxis attack and I was just sitting there like, okay, do I go to the ER and risk COVID or do I sit here and risk dying? And it was just like, you know, take as much meds as I can to try to wait it out. And luckily I did not have to go to the ER. As far as the benefits, it's been kind of cool because I do all my med all my appointments now through telehealth. Some of my specialists are like two, three hours away. That's kind of cool. Did it from my bed. My doctor wanted to draw some blood work recently. I got to pull right up and get drive through blood work from the car. So that was kind of cool because that day I wasn't walking very well. And so I didn't have to move. Like Matt drove me up and they just, I hung my arm out the window. <laughs> so what are some things that you've noticed? how this has impacted you? Well, for me, like you said, I think dealing with the isolation really hasn't necessarily bothered me much just because I'm used to being at home, right? Not going to physical therapy is kind of tough. I do physical therapy for the most part at home, but I do go in at least once a month to my PT to check in and review exercises and get my diaphragm scraped in particular. And I haven't been able to do that. So that's been very frustrating. I think, you know, dealing with, I recently actually got denied for disability once again. Me too. So dealing with that whole process again and, <laughs> you know, getting my paperwork and dealing with being on hold for four plus hours a day and then getting hung up on after one minute oh. with no progress. So, you know, and I've been through what, just dealing appeals. with stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Two appeals. Nope. I'm, I'm so sorry you're having to deal with that. Disability is so hard to deal with. Oh, yeah. It's like a complete just mind boggle just trying to deal with this and it's like I always explain it where it's like you constantly have to try to convince yourself that one day there's hope that you will get better while trying to convince the government that you won't get better you know yeah. and show them what's on paper but still trying to deny the fact that what's on paper still might not be your future you know it's just this complete just screw up that you just it just screws up your head so much like for me it's just a constant mental battle of just like it's a process yeah it's a fight. it really is and and a lawyer I spoke with actually was telling me that it's almost luck of the draw as well because if you get in front of a judge that has no idea what EDS is, which most people don't, you know, your chances of getting denied are going to be pretty high. And it's just not fair. It is, it's oh yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> and I've been told as well, they say, well, oh, because you're young and you had a good career and you'll get paid pretty okay money, then they'll deny you the first few times. And it's like, but my doctor is saying that I'm fully disabled and you know, the paperwork that says patient can barely feed oneself or patient cannot bathe oneself properly, that's not enough, you know? So it, it makes no sense to me. This whole entire process is just so sad. No, it's basically like having to prove you're not faking. It's like they automatically think you are, and then you just have to prove that you're not. Because 
there's no way these people can look at our diagnosis on paper, all of the things we've gone through, and say, nope, you're not disabled. yet that continues to still happen. baffling to me. it's it's sad because there are people that have taken abuse of the system and have caused the government to be so cautious like this. but it's really sad because i mean when brandy submitted hers it was i think it was like 15 different doctors over the course of her life that that was like 14 or 15 yeah so it's not like she came up with these names it was like just i mean it's maddening it really is maddening and they're still like nope you're not disabled (laughs) it's like yes i am (laughs) i mean but I'm so sorry that you're having to go through that as well. It's insane. I mean, what they also need to realize is they make it so hard that if you're someone who's going to be like abusing the system and faking it, it's so difficult. It's like, if you're going to fake it, you're going to have to go through all of these hoops and all of this paperwork and all of, I mean, the majority of people that are willing to go through all of that are not faking anything. So it's just insane. Oh, yeah. And the, the medical records alone they have is like, why is that not proof? I have the one primary sent over 229 pages and my mouth is just dropped. I'm like, you have that much paperwork on me? And she's like, oh, Sarah, you'll, don't you worry, Sarah, it'll be okay. And then I got my denial and it's like, how do you have records from, like you said, 14 plus doctors. I thought 20 plus doctors in my lifetime at least now. Yeah. It's like you have all this and yet you still deny people. Yeah. So I get what you mean. It's just... And it's just mind-blowing that this is happening to so many of us, too. It's not even a few. It's the majority of us do not get approved nope. and have to fight like this. Exactly. And and my um, uh, the person I was working with with disability actually said the same thing they told you, that this was an open and shut case. Like, I should be like, no problem. They didn't even make me go before the disability doctor. It was just straight denied. Yeah, yeah I never went in front of a doctor yet either. Yeah. So they send me letters that say we might, but then they never do, and then Same. they just deny you. Yep. And then yeah. my my friend who also has EDS, she actually got sent to the doctor, and um and that day she was in a flare, all her braces, the whole thing, and she said that the disability doctor said to her, "This is an a slam dunk," and she got denied. It makes no sense. It's ridiculous. And then wow, it's like if you're gonna deny us, at least let us have access to things that help us, like cannabis. For me, I can't take pain medications because of my mast cell issues. I, if I take them, I pay a price, like hives or itchiness or like, so I have to be like on death's door to take pain medication. But I have no problem taking cannabis as long as, you know, I get a good strain and things like that, which sometimes doesn't happen. But luckily we found someone that, you know, gets the medical grade quality and all of that stuff. But I can't really say too much about it because I don't want him to go to jail. So it's like, but um, yeah, it's it's just it's baffling how society it works. Is. And like you said, how how is it fair? Like it, it's not fair. It's just it's so sickening that we're allowing suffering as a society when it could be helped or remedied by cannabis. You know, you look at people even with seizures, for example. Like that can cause brain damage. It can cause death. There are so many things that can happen. It's such a dangerous thing, and then you see someone take enough cannabis oil, and they don't have a seizure, or it stops the seizure. And it's like, how dare you take this as something and take it away from people and take away the right to be able to use this as medicine? Right. And it's like, what side effects does it? Because there are no side effects except maybe eating a lot and maybe being high. <laughs> and then you exactly. have these pills, and it's like, hey, it might cause death or cancers or this and that. And it's like, oh, well, find me up for that one, right? It's, right. It makes no sense. <laughs> Exactly. And also, I, I was reading your decision to go more like a holistic route. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's not necessarily that I, I won't see doctors. Um, it's been very difficult for me to find a doctor. Mm-hmm. I was blessed in Wisconsin that eventually I did find a primary, um, but I would go see specialists and she found me to rheumatologists and cardiologists and pain management doctors. And the amount of it's, it's really medical abuse is what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. The things that have been said to me, I would never go alone. I always took my husband just because it's like, I feel like no one is even going to leave, believe that this stuff is real, that these doctors are saying to me. Um, and I do have PTSD from going to see a doctor, from a, one doctor in particular. And it sent me to therapy. It's something that's been very difficult for me. And meeting new doctors gives me very bad anxiety. I get scared. I shut down. Right now, talking to me, you know, I'm, seem like a confident person, I'm sure, right? Like, I advocate for cannabis, I advocate for myself. But when it comes to talking to doctors, it's a very different story for me. I, I get very scared, 
mm-hmm. and I hate the judgment that comes with it. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that that's a lot of the problem for me of not being able to find an accurate doctor. Here I've come to Las Vegas and I've met over four doctors already, and every time it's been either, A, I won't see you because you need a boatload of specialists and there's nothing I can do for you either. And I had one doctor, and I actually took my mom with me to this appointment, but he said, oh, well, unfortunately, you'll just be in a wheelchair, and, you know, why don't you move to California? UCLA is there. Maybe they could help you. Oh, gosh. It's like, well, well, I'm here. And he's like, oh, well, you know, maybe you'll just need a bunch of Vicodin. And it's like, first of all, they don't even give that to pain patients anymore. Fun fact, because of the opiate crisis, it's very, fast, very, very hard for us to get pain medication anymore. Wow. And then in addition to that, it's just like, I can't keep begging for doctors, you know. And I thought pain management for six months. I took Tramadol. I'm not against um, pills at all. I say plants or pills. Do what you have to do to live your best life. And don't let anyone shame you for that. Yes. Um, but that day, I was actually... You know, it's $60 to go to pain management, plus my insurance is a $600 charge for my drug test every time because they didn't cover it. So we're paying out of pocket a ridiculous amount of money plus my insurance. And I kind of, you know, I've come a lot back to my spirituality down here and I ask for like a bit of a sign of what to do. So I put this money I'm wasting towards trauma all. And for me, it gives me a lot of bad side effects with like anxiety and my mind and my mental health really, really goes down with it. Um, so I told the doctor that. And ironically that day I failed my drug test and it got switched up with someone else's. And I was just treated horribly. And they said, you know, have you tried medication? And, you know, maybe you did take these other pills and they didn't believe me at all. And to me, that was kind of my sign of I didn't move 1800 miles to beg for pills anymore yeah. I didn't move here to try to convince a doctor of what's wrong with me I know what's wrong with me I know what I'm doing to try to help myself I know I'm using cannabis and I just didn't move this far to beg for help anymore I can't do that anymore mentally I can't do it I do have to go back and find a primary once the world reopens so wish me luck on that I'm um, just because I do need that you know to keep track of like my heart issues and you know do my blood work once in a while and do little stuff that I do need but other than that I think for me it's just I can't mentally keep fighting for a doctor to try to help me when there really is no help for me and I'm doing my own thing and trying to help myself right now yeah uh you hit the nail on the head on that one yeah it's like uh going to these doctors and begging and like having them look at you like you're a pain med seeker that's happened to me before and like an ER visit when I dislocated my hip doing spin class and they basically looked at me like I was a drug seeker you know uh, just kind of dismissed me and it was like you know uh, that's not what's happening right now I mean it's so sad that that's what we have to do um and and with me I even had so many doctors I went to before my diagnosis and I would ask them like do you think I could have EDS I seem to have this this and this googled the EDS, you know, uh, evaluation, I think the Brighton score is what it's called. Oh, yeah, the Brighton scale. Yeah, and uh, Googled how to do that, push my joints around, and they're like, a little bit, and they're like, nope, you don't appear to have any connective tissue disorders, and I knew that I did, so it's like I just had to keep, like, going on and on and on, you know, just, like, shotgun approach, like, maybe this person will give it to me, maybe that person will give it to me, and I finally found uh, the referral to the geneticist through my gynecologist because my primary care wouldn't give it to me. And it's like, I just am so done with begging people to listen. And I, I just wanted to come back and, you know, put that diagnosis in his face and <laughs> be like, you were wrong <laughs> because I do have a connective tissue disorder. You know, it's just like, they won't listen. I remember I was looked at like a crazy person. And then it was like, are you sure you don't need antidepressants? Yeah. No, <laughs> it's like antidepressants. Oh, yeah. Are I have been given those numerous times. Yeah. It's like when your body's on fire, it's hard to be in a good mood. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, for me, it, it does help right now not seeing a doctor because I do have a physical therapist. Um, he kind of, in a, in a way, has kind of taken over that role for me. Yes. Where he knows about EDS and he helps me with things and he answers questions and you know, we needed a bone scan and he was able, he's a, he's a clinical director, so he's a doctor um, at the clinic. And he was able to order my bone scan for me, you know, my bone density scan I needed. So that was helpful. Um, so, of course, I need to find one soon. But yeah. that is definitely a blessing to at least have him in the meantime. Do you know that is exactly what happened to me? We had two doctors deny us because they didn't want some a patient with EDS. And, and my PT ended up being like my... My go-to because I was so lucky to find a, a physical therapist here that worked with people with Ehlers Danlos, and it was so funny when I walked in. I don't know if this happens to you, but I was the only one like under 60, I think, 
and I like um I, I went to sign in and the woman was like you know so which air what part of your body are you here for I'm like well I have EDS so all of it <laughs> and so it's like and then the, then the, the woman same thing like, yeah <laughs> really <laughs> I'm like I don't know what they're charging insurance for but I'm here for my whole body yeah <laughs> all, exactly. all of it yeah <laughs> um so question the um the last post that I think that I saw of yours on Instagram, you looked like you were at like this convention or something. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, um, was that the one with the leaf? The, yeah, you know, one of yeah. Had, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was great. Um, that was at USA CBD Expo, and I was able to go there and meet with a lot of vendors. And I did a media piece there. And you can look it up on Instagram. It's hashtag CBD and me. So it was just an opportunity to go there and kind of share my my journey with moving for cannabis and CBD and how this helped me in my life. And it was a, a project designed to help kind of show exactly what it does for the medical community and how it changes lives. So it was a really amazing movement to be part of. And then in November, I also spoke at the um, CBD, CBD.io Expo. And that one I was um, advocating for cannabis as well as terpene. So that one was really exciting. I got to talk to a lot of people about terpenes and why we need the education and why it's so necessary for medicinal patients and even recreational users to choose the right experience for them. So that was definitely an amazing opportunity. I'm so thankful to be able to do this and to be speaking. I never thought I would be doing this, but I'm so, so thankful every single day I'm able to. Yeah, you're awesome at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the terpene piece is always something that's interesting to me. What would you say some of the things you find useful with terpenes? So the most important thing to know about terpenes is it's not just the smell of the plant. It has proven medicinal value. So one of my favorite ones real quick is mercine, for instance. It's proven that it's anti-inflammatory. It has mild sedative properties. It helps you with your muscles, your joint pain. These are all things that have proven relief benefits. And then in addition to that, terpenes are not just in cannabis. They're in food. So I eat a, tons of mangoes. Every mango I can get my hands on. I actually did not like mangoes before. I figured out they had mercy. But I eat them now like candy because it's, they have mercy. And so they help boost it in my body and help me get that extra amount of pain relief that I'm looking for as well as lemongrass. Oh so God. these are all things that you can really take piece by piece and put in your life. Like black pepper. I love black pepper. I always did. But now I'm like obsessed with it because it has cariophyllene. <laughs> and that naturally is an anti-inflammatory. It's going to help that joint pain. And these are all things I'm learning once I... Once I tried cannabis and it was like, okay, I need to know why this is helping me when doctors said there was nothing for me. So I started studying and that's when all the research and all the science started coming away with me. And in my highlights, I do have about 15, I believe now I have up, but I have all those highlighted as well. And I have a terpene podcast that I did where you can kind of hear me chat about terpenes and doing information all about each and every terpene where we go through each one individually just because it's so important for people to know and the labeling is necessary and then to know that it's in your food. Like, I wish I knew this in Wisconsin. Like, I would be eating black pepper and mangoes like crazy. Yeah. I don't know if it would help me the most in, you know, snowy, snowy weather, but it would help some, you know. Yeah. So these are all things that I'm really learning with terpenes, and it's not the smell. It's medicinal, I promise. It's wow. proven. I'm about to go get some uh, mangoes and put black pepper on them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. to make sandwiches. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you for that information. <laughs> Definitely. If you guys ever want to have a terpene chat, I am all here for it. I love talking about terpenes. I think it's so important that people know this and in recreational and even legal and legal markets like yourself, you know, there's so many things that you can take and there's even C B D that incorporate terpenes. There's not as many companies as there should be, but there are a few amount that do incorporate terpenes in their product. Oh, ours does in Asheville. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's this one what was our our lemon one or something? Um, sour lemon haze or something. Oh yeah, lemon haze. Yeah. Yeah, that one worked really, really well. But then they discontinued it. Yeah, they so. <laughs> they ro they rotate out their crops with different strands as they're. It's really cool uh, to have flower CBD because in others, not every state has that. We at least have that much access, which has been nice. So Sarah, now now that you've explained Ellers Domlos and cannabis and some of your journey, what are what's something you would like people to take away from your knowledge in this podcast? I really want people to understand that there could be hope with cannabis for them. There could be hope with dry climate. There could be hope with something out there for them. I want people, whenever they hear me speak, that's something that I always want people to understand, that there could be something. Like I said, there was a day that I did not want tomorrow to happen. I was extremely depressed. I was suicidal. 
it was, I could never, ever see this for myself right now. And then it happened. And even back then, if someone would have told me one day you'll have some less pain and live in Vegas, I would have laughed and said, you're crazy. I use cannabis now at home. Like, it doesn't help that much. But it does. It does help me that much. And it does help a lot of people that much. Mm -hmm. And I just want people to understand that there could be something more than there is right now. And to hold on to that. And no matter what it is, fight for it. Your life is worth it. I promise you that. And it's so important to just hold on for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's just something that I want people to know. Just keep holding on for tomorrow. I love that. That's perfect. Thank you mm-hmm. so much for joining us on our podcast and sharing your stories and your journey from going to Wisconsin to Vegas and and sharing like what what hardships you've had because it it's so powerful and we really appreciate your yeah. time and everyone will have a link to her Instagram on this podcast and yeah. like where can we find you uh, tell everyone any links or information yeah. or anything you would like someone to know that you want to promote yeah absolutely so you can find me just on Instagram at rising underscore zebra and they'll have it linked here of course like they said so have highlights within my bio where you can see other speaking things I've done other podcasts etc but you can find me right here right now at the credit on the chronic couple podcast and then on Instagram. Woo-hoo. All right. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> thank you And thank so you so much for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. I listened to your first episode. I was like, I love you guys. You guys are just, I just love you guys. You guys are great. So thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We think you're awesome, and we really appreciate it. I mean, uh, this is, you've taught us some things. Yeah. I'm about to go get some mangoes. <laughs> we, got, we got some stuff we got to get now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was. Oh so yeah, nice. you have any questions? I am always here for you, Brandy. Just message me anytime. You as well, Matt. Awesome. I will be here. And when you guys come to Vegas one day, I will be ready at the airport with some joints for you. Yes. Don't you worry. All right. Oh, we're we're gonna do that. Yeah. No, that, that's that. happening. That's <laughs> happening. Yeah. Yes, because we. Oh, I'm so ready for it. When people come down, I'm like, let me take you to the dispensary. Where do you want to go? Let's go. I'll help you out. Yeah. I love it. So yes, please. When you guys come out, I'll be ready for you. We cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for listening and. Have a good day.